Hi everybody, welcome to my YouTube channel Dr. Srinivas Medical Concepts and my FB page Dr. Srinivas Concepts. This is Dr. Srinivas, neurologist from Andhra Pradesh, India. I am also the medical author of the book Focused Neurology. Today we will talk about a very very interesting, a purely clinical topic, the patterns of sensory loss and the joy of clinical neurology. Just by looking the pattern of sensory loss, we can make out the diagnosis. Just looking clinically at the pattern of the sensory loss, we can make a diagnosis without all these investigations, CT or MRI or EEG. So that's the joy of clinical neurology. So what are these sensory patterns, the characteristic sensory patterns which give us clue to the clinical diagnosis. There are basically eight patterns of sensory loss by which if we analyze thoroughly, we can even reach a clinical diagnosis. We can make a diagnosis confidently without investigations. So what are these eight patterns of sensory loss? First, we have a hemispheric type of sensory loss. Entire sensory loss on one side of the body, including the face, thorax, upper limbs and the lower limbs, one side. The second pattern is loss, sensory loss only on one side of the face and the sensory loss on the opposite side of the body. And the third, a definite level on the abdomen and the thorax below which we lose all sensations. And the fourth pattern is a loss only in the upper part of the thorax and the hands, a dissociated type of sensory loss. And the fifth pattern of sensory loss is in the hands and the legs, the glove and stocking type of sensory loss. And then the seventh, sixth pattern is that we have a kind of sensory loss on one side and another type of sensory loss on the other side. And the last two patterns pertains to the dermatomes, one on the upper limb and the other on the lower limb. So now let's see each pattern in detail and go methodically step by step. The first is a hemisensory pattern of sensory loss entirely on one side, which includes the face, the thorax, upper limbs and the lower limbs entirely on one side. Imagine on the right side, if there's a complete hemisensory loss. So where all there could be, could there be lesions? One, in the thalamus where all the spinothalamic tract posterior column sensations come and join and from the thalamus it goes to the post central gyrus in the parietal lobe. So a lesion in the thalamus or the parietal cortex that is post central gyrus will cause a hemisensory loss on the opposite. So suppose there is a left parietal cortex lesion, person will have a right hemisensory loss. So this is the first pattern of the sensory loss. The second is a person will have sensory loss on only the face on one side but on the body on the opposite side. A facial sensory loss on one side but a hemisensory loss on the opposite side of the body. How do we explain this? We can explain this in the Wallenberg syndrome that is the lateral medullary syndrome where the spinothalamic tract and the spinal tract of the fifth nerve gets affected. When the spinal tract of the fifth nerve gets affected the pain and temperature loss of the face is on the same side. But since spinothalamic tract crosses over and goes to the opposite side, pain and temperature is affected on the opposite side of the body. So pain and temperature loss on the same side of the face, but pain and temperature loss on the opposite side of the body, it is very suggestive of Wallenberg syndrome or lateral medullary syndrome. And the third pattern of sensory loss is a definite level a definite level on the thorax below which all the sensations are lost. It could be spinothalamic, it could be posterior column, it could be autonomic. All the sensations are lost below a certain level. Obviously it has to be a clear cut spinal cord lesion because all the sensations are present in a small cross section of the spinal cord and therefore when there is a section of the spinal cord or when the spinal cord is affected all the sensations below the particular level is lost. So when there's a comp when there's a clear cut level below which all the sensations are lost, then it has to be in the spinal cord level. 
Then we have a very interesting phenomenon where wherein the pain and temperature sensations are lost but the posterior column sensations are spared. The pain and temperature is carried by spinothalamic tract and the joint position vibration sense is carried by posterior column. So if there is a lesion in the center of the spinal cord, the crossing spinothalamic tract fibers get affected but posterior column sensations are spared. This is known as dissociated sensory loss. Pain and temperature sensation loss but joint position vibration sense carried by posterior column are spared. So dissociated sensory loss we, we see that in syringomyelia and it is usually seen in the thorax and the hands because the lesion is usually in the cervical regions. And then another characteristic pattern of sensory loss we see wherein there is a sensory loss only in the hands and then in the legs. We refer to that as glove and stocking type of sensory loss. We must have seen in the cricket when they bat they wear gloves. So when the sensory loss is only confined to the hands that is the gloves and we see the nurses wearing socks up to the level of the knees. We call that as stocking. So when there is a sensory loss in the gloves, in the hands and stockings up to the knee, then it suggests that it's a peripheral nerve disease, a peripheral neuropathy. One of the common causes of peripheral neuropathy is diabetes. So here what happens is a graded sensory loss. The distal most parts get affected first and then as it ascends, it comes to the more and more proximal areas. It is known as length dependent peripheral neuropathy. We see this as, as in an axonal type of peripheral neuropathy. The distal parts don't get nutrients. Then the next distal part, then the more proximal part. So as the neuropathy starts worsening, the sensory loss comes from the distal to the more and more proximal areas. So it's a length dependent neuropathy. And one more important concept here is that once the sensory loss ascends to the level of the knees, then the sensory loss should have started in the hands. So if a person says that he's got sensory loss bilaterally suggestive of peripheral neuropathy, a graded type of sensory loss up to the thighs, but, this, but the sensation loss is not there in the hands, that means you have to take it as a hysterical or a functional sensory disorder. Because once there's a sensory loss up to the level of the knees as it ascends to the knees, the sensations or the hands should have got lost very important clinical point. So in peripheral neuropathy there is a glove and stocking type of sensory loss where there is sensory loss in the hands and the stockings up to the level of the knee it is graded. The distal part the most distal part is the severest then as it ascends it becomes graded and becomes less and less intense and less and less serious. So it becomes uh, the sensations become uh, appreciable. Right. And then we have another interesting kind of sensory loss which we call as brown sequard syndrome. Suppose there is a hemisection of the spinal cord, what happens the posterior column which crosses at the level of the medulla oblongata but at the level of the spinal cord it is on the same side. So when there is a lesion of the spinal cord hemisection, the posterior column sensations that is touch position vibration sense are lost on the same side but the sensations carried by spinothalamic tract that is pain temperature sensations are lost on the opposite side because the spinothalamic tract crosses at the level of the spinal cord one or two segments and then goes to the opposite side. So when there is a section of the spinal cord there is an ipsilateral posterior column sensations loss and contralateral spinothalamic tract sensation loss. So ipsilaterally position joint vibration sense are lost because of the posterior column involvement and on the opposite side spinothalamic tract sensations are lost that is pain temperature sensations are lost. So if you find an ipsilateral posterior column sensations lost and contralateral spinothalamic tract sensation loss, it is brown sequard syndrome, another characteristic pattern. Then we have a, a sensory loss in a particular dermatomal distribution. Example C5 in the arm or in the thumb C6 or middle finger C7 or the little finger C8. So if we have a sensory loss in particular dermatomal territory, obviously it is a a dermatomal pattern. Likewise in the lower limbs also we can have a dermatomal pattern. For example the loss may be on the lateral side to begin with but then it may go into the web space between the big toe and the second toe that indicates it is L5 radiculopathy. So if there is a sensory loss here on the arm you say it is C5 radiculopathy and the knee laterally and then coming between the big toe and the second toe a web space sensory loss you call it as an 
it's an L5 level dermatome, so it becomes L5 radiculopathy. So by knowing all these characteristic sensory patterns, when we approach clinically and we analyze the sensory symptoms, then we can even make a diagnosis. That's the joy of clinical neurology. So if we approach a person systematically, analyze all his clinical symptoms, including the spinothalamic tract and posterior column sensations, how they are affected, where they are affected, the site and the where and what of the lesions, we can make the diagnosis, the clinical diagnosis confidently. That's the joy of clinical neurology. I hope you have enjoyed listening to this lecture. If you have any suggestions or comments, kindly post on to my YouTube channel. But please like and subscribe my YouTube channel, Dr. Srinivas Medical Concepts and my FB page, Dr. Srinivas Concepts. Thank you. Bye.